Thank you. Yeah, glorious, glorious, glorious. All right, praise the Lord. You guys know where we are, right? I mean, you know what we're doing? <clears throat> I know. Everybody's going, what are you talking about? Well, you know, last week, of course, we've been in a series called Following Jesus. And it's a series about what happens when you really follow Jesus. Because all of us at times have been challenged to follow Jesus. And we say, amen, let's do it. Praise the Lord, I wanna follow Jesus. And um, we really don't know what we're signing up for when we say things like that. Because uh, there are many instances in the scripture, the Bible records many of the great happenings. And I say that because some of them were, were miracles and some of them were just events that happened that show us what it really means to follow Jesus. And of course, this challenges our faith. It speaks to our confidence. Uh, songs like we just finished, he was faithful then, he'll be faithful now. And it gives us, uh, it gives us hope to hang. It gives us a, 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 a rack, a hook to hang our hope on. Some, some realness about what Jesus actually did when he walked on this earth and what we can expect now. And oftentimes what we expect is not um, it doesn't line up with actually uh, what it means to follow Jesus because Jesus, following Jesus, and you've heard me say this m many times in the series so far, that following Jesus is lots of things, but it's not safe. Your soul is safe, your eternity is safe, your spirit is safe, but that's pretty much about it. Uh, everything else is, whew, is up there, and uh, he challenges our life in every other way. And, um, and that's a good thing because that's what living for Jesus is really all about. Now, we've, th this is the sixth message. Last week, we took a week off for Father's Day, and I encourage you fathers to reflect the image of Jesus. To be Christ-like means to reflect the image of Christ, the anointed one, and we talked all about that and how to be a prophet, priest, and king in your home and what God expects for you and all of that kind of stuff. Um, if you miss that, you say, man, I don't even know what you're talking about, but it sounds interesting, um, just go to YouTube or go to our website and you can look for the messages there, all of that. Uh, first week, we looked at the woman at the well and we found out that uh, if we follow Jesus, we'll find ourselves walking toward many things that we would rather avoid in life. And then at the, at the uh, woman at the well, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, um, you offer what you have now. You give God your, your only. We went to John 21, where Jesus met with his disciples and challenged Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. And we found out that all of us are following the same person. We're all following Jesus, but we're not all following the same path. There are lots of ways that the Lord leads us in our individual uh, purpose in life. And then the fourth week, we saw Peter walking on water. And we found out that following Jesus often places us in a storm. And when we're in that storm, most often you can only see the next step in front of you. So it's not comfortable in those times. And then we went on the fifth week and saw Jesus walk on the water. And when Jesus walked on the water, uh, we learned that just about the time we're becoming accustomed to the storm, uh, the Lord moves us to the other side. So anyway, those are some of the kind of interesting things we've seen so far. This is the sixth week, and we're gonna look at Jesus in another storm this week. This storm, however, involves the disciples and Jesus in a boat out on the Sea of Galilee. And this giant storm comes in. And well, well, let's just read about it. Look in Mark 4. Mark 4, verse 35. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. That, that's interesting. I don't really have a lot of insight on as he was, but it just must, it, it, it means that however, I, I guess he prepared sometimes to travel. <laughs> I don't know. They just took him like he was right there on the spot. Um, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. 
And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and they said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So Jesus calms this raging storm on the Sea of Galilee, which I say, wow, you know, what an amazing, I mean, you just speak to the storm. What an in incredible event. The disciples, Jesus says, let's go to the other side. They all get in a boat, cross over the, in, uh, the Sea of Galilee. When they get right out in the middle or somewhere out, way away from the land, the, the sea uh, becomes uh, shaken with the wind and this gigantic storm blows in. And at first they all feel, I'm sure, quite comfortable because after all, Jesus is on the boat with them. They have God in the boat with them. So why should they be upset by a little storm? But it, they found that when they went to, to, to inform him of this, as if somehow he might need to be informed that there was a storm, they found him asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat. Just when they need him most, he's fast asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat. Now, I know that I started to say many people, I would say most people come to church to try to find an answer to their messed up life. Whatever's going on in your life, uh, it's messy, right? And you know God has an answer for that. And if you can just hear the right thing, then you can no longer be messed up in life. Now, I know this is going to sound strange, but let me just say this to you. The fact that you have a messy life may not indicate at all that something's wrong with your life. It might indicate the exact opposite. It might indicate that actually something is right in your life. And how can this be? Because following Jesus is not safe. It's not clean all the time. It's not uncluttered. Following Jesus often gets really messy. And Jesus takes us into all kinds of issues in life and leads us into all kinds of storms in life <laughs> that we would rather avoid. And when we get in them, we often think, if I would just get right with God, I wouldn't have to be like this. But that's not true at all. So let's look at what this storm that Jesus calms in the middle of the sea, let's see what it teaches us about the truth of following Jesus. I'll give you three observations. Obviously, you know this. That means this is from God. Observation number one, when you are following Jesus, sometimes it feels like he is sleeping in the middle of your storm. Uh, amen on that. <laughs> How many of you have ever felt like Jesus was asleep, was asleep in the middle of some storm that you're in. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, and the rest of you that didn't say amen, just come right on down here to the altar because we need to cast that spirit of lying right out of you right now. Absolutely not. And to add insult to the injury, not only were they in a storm, Jesus dragged them into that storm. Who was it that put them on the boat and said, let's go to the other side? Why, wasn't it that one that is in the back of the boat now fast asleep on a cushion? Wasn't, isn't he the captain of this ill-fated boat trip? Sure he is. So Jesus actually put them in the storm. And when you follow the Lord, you'll find out that actually God puts us in storms many times. And, and the disciples were in this storm specifically because they were obeying Jesus and doing what Jesus told them to do. Now, we generally don't talk about things like this, especially at church, but uh, God does drag us into storms. That being a Christian doesn't mean a life of uh, all honey and no bees, uh, no work and all ease, uh, that there are many things that the Lord puts us through and drags us through. And then many times the very storm that he drags us into, it seems like he's taken his own sweet time to do something about this storm and whenever we talk about it to others, most of the time, here's the comment you get. Hey, 
I'm praying for you, brother. You know God will never leave you. You know God's, not, God's right there with you in that storm, and so you just don't be afraid, and God's going God's to be with you. Now, what we want is, all right, if God is with us, then why isn't God doing anything about this storm? I know he's here, and I appreciate the fact that he will never leave me and he will never forsake me, but I'd like for him to wake up and do something with these circumstances that I'm in. Well, may I give you a suggestion? Now, this, this comes after 49 years of following, following the Lord. I came to Jesus when I was 16 years old, 49 years. And here's a suggestion. If God's not moving, you don't move either. If God's not moving in your storm, if he seems to be relaxed and all calm about it and you're wanting to be torn up about it, what I've learned is there's a reason why God is not moving. And if you'll just relax a minute, and if he's not moving, you don't, you don't move either. I know it sounds ridiculous. If God's sleeping, then maybe you need to sleep too. Because this nap is really preaching to us, isn't it? Jesus is in the back of the boat asleep. Now, God is so amazing that even when he takes a nap, that nap can preach to us. What is, what is the nap saying to us? What is the message that, that the Lord is giving us? Well, we're freaking out and he's asleep. <laughs> what? what? I mean, we're gonna drown. The wind's blowing, the waves are splashing over, the boat's filling up with water. It looks like, boy, we're going down at any moment and we are just beside ourselves. And there he is in the back of the boat and he's sound asleep. So who is the one that is omniscient? That means knows everything. Who is the one who knows everything? Well, if the one who knows everything is asleep, that ought to tell us something about the situation. I mean, if, if, if the boat goes down, we're all going down. We're all together. We all go. So if he's asleep, what's it, what does that mean? It, well, it's a, it's a lesson in trusting is what it's really all about. Have you ever met anybody that really does trust the Lord? I mean, actually, you get laid off. I mean, just as an example, or you get a, you know, repossession or, you know, whatever it is that might shake your boat. You get that and then, you meet this person and they're just like calm. Uh, I mean, it's not like they're on drugs. It's like, you know, uh, they just seem to be confident. Uh, it, how can you be confident you just lost your job, man? Well, I, I've been in places like this before and I know God is with me and he's brought me through and I'm gonna keep pursuing. I'm gonna try to find another job and I'm gonna keep walking and I'm gonna keep praying and I'm gonna keep looking and I'm gonna keep watching. And hey, I just know God and God's gonna bring me through. Now, if you ever met anybody like that, if you really ever meet anybody like that, it'd pretty much tick you off. You'll be sitting there going, how in the world can you be that calm about this thing? Man, don't you know? I mean, hello, you know, like Mac Fly, is anybody home, home up there? You got PTSD or STP or AOD, whatever it might be. But trusting God is is a relaxing thing. And, and, and see, and here's the thing, and I know we all used to wear those braces, WWJD, you know, and I know y'all know that means what would Jesus do? Well, all right, what would Jesus do if he got laid off? I mean, is he gonna panic about it? Is he gonna, I mean, what would Jesus, after all, we say that we're following Jesus, right? So what would Jesus do if this happened to him? That's the response that we're looking for. And if it feels like he's sleeping in your storm, then I'm just gonna to suggest to you that you do the same thing. In fact, in verse 39, look at this. Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace be still. And they do. <laughs> the wind ceased and there was a, a great calm. Well, does that tell us anything? Sure it does. It shows that the calm that Jesus brought in the midst of the storm, and I don't want this to sound too philosophical, but I think it's absolutely true. The storm that Jesus, the, the calm that Jesus brings in this storm, which is an actual, real, 
physical thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is spiritualized or anything. It really happened. I believe it just like it says it in the Bible and the wind stopped blowing and the waves just settled down and everything became calm. But I believe what that is is a mirror reflection of this intense calm that is on the inside of Jesus. And when Jesus says, peace, be still, it's just a reflection of how Jesus is on the inside. Is God ever anxious? Is God ever nervous about anything? No. (laughs) Well, then if we're following Jesus, then he says, follow me. How many of you have ever read the book of James? We don't have the scripture up here, but you've ever read the book of James? If you ever have, you you get to the second verse. (laughs) I mean, it's right off the bat. You get to the actual second verse in the book, and it says, hey, brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials because the testing of your faith creates patience and let patience have her perfect work in you that that doesn't mean perfect in terms of no faults it means perfect in terms of maturing growing mature it has a perfecting work in you right where let patience have her perfecting work in you that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing that's what storms sometimes are about. That very thing right there. Look, we're going we're gonna to let you get a little rattled. We're going to let you get a little upset. We're going to put you in, in, in some extreme conditions here. And we're going to just stand back and I'm going to sleep at the, at the stern of the back of the boat back there. And uh, we're just going to ride this thing out so that patience, endurance can work patience. And patience can begin maturing you so that that you can stand the issues of life. I mean, there are lots of things in life that are going to rattle you and are going to just bomb you. Well, if every time something happens, you just go out into the twilight zone, what kind of life is that going to be? It's going to be a pitiful life. So God says, all right, we're going to do something about it. You know what we're going to do? We're going to let you endure some things so that patience can work perfection into you so that you'll have a much better, happier life. All right. So if you feel like God is sleeping through your storm, welcome to the party. If Jesus is sleeping, it's okay for you to sleep. All right, observation number two. When you're following Jesus, sometimes you wonder if he cares. Listen to how the disciples wake him up. Verse 38. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him by saying to him, (laughs) teacher, (laughs) teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? I mean, (laughs) have you ever ever heard a discouraged Christian say, I just don't think God cares? Maybe you are that discouraged Christian that said, I don't think God cares. And I know what we want to do. We want to correct them just as quickly as possible. But, But let me make another suggestion to us. And I know this might sound strange, but... When you are at the point of frustration and anxiety and, 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 and pain to the point where you begin to even question whether God cares about you, I believe that God can use that frame of mind as a platform to connect to you. Now, I mean, th- th- all right, think about how casual and how immature and how childish, not childlike, we can be with God. I mean, think about how casual we, we can, uh, Lord, thank you for that, Lord, thank you for that. Lord, uh, be with me here, oh God. Give me, um, you bring out your list, give me, give me, give me, give me in Jesus' name. I mean, that, that, that's our relationship. It's so casual, it's so, it's so non-involved, but all of a sudden here comes a storm in life, and... At least we have enough passion to say, I don't think God cares. God, don't you care about me? Because complaining, I'm submitting to you that complaining is a form of prayer. And if you don't believe it, just ask King David or ask Moses or ask Jacob or Job or Jonah or almost any other biblical character that you want to 
talk to about it. Complaining to God is really, uh, and I know it's weird, but it's a, it's a form of prayer. I mean, this bunch better be glad that I wa- I'm not God because if they came back there and woke me up like that after all the things I had done for them, after all the ways I had cared for them, after all the miraculous things this bunch had seen, after all of the great teaching that they had seen and been through, and the first thing they do when it gets a little tight is they come back there shaking me saying, don't you care that we're dying? Man, I jump up, look right at them and say, what? I'll suck the life right out of you right now. Wait, wait, what, what? Peace, be still. What now? What do you <laughs> But that's not what Jesus does, is it? Look at verse 39. He awoke, and I don't even like to use the word woke, but you'll see. Uh, he was awakened. All right, let's use that. Is that would that be right? Uh, woke, just, I don't like that word. Um, he awoke, and he, and he rebuked the disciples. No, what, what does that? He rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, peace. So, He rebuked the elements, not the disciples. I would want to rebuke the disciples. I would want to put a hammer on the disciples. That's what I would be upset about. But Jesus just rebukes the elements and then he he, he corrects his disciples a little later. But the first thing he does, he rebukes the wind, he rebukes the storm. See, the reason we want to rebuke the disciples first, I think, is because Somehow we think God is like us and God gets intimidated by a little criticism. Well, let me just tell you something in case you hadn't learned this. Your criticism doesn't intimidate God. And the fact that you are wondering if he even cares about you, that's not a real problem for God. As a matter of fact, I believe that God actually thrives on criticism. You say, Pastor, what in the world are you talking about? All right, think about this. God calls King David a man after his own heart. Now, that's not David's mama talking about him. That's God talking about him. He's a man after my own heart. Well, we know David was a tremendous sinner. I mean, none of us would want David living next door to us. If he moved in, we would leave the neighborhood. So it wasn't that David was perfect that God was talking about. And David, I don't know if you're aware of this, but David was one of the greatest complainers that's ever been recorded. But at least David had enough uh, fire about him to put into words the way he was really feeling emotionally at the time. And he did it, and, and, and David would say stuff like, God, I'm good, and they're bad. So because I'm good... I want you to let me live. And because they're bad, God, I want you to kill them. What? David, you have issues, man. You can't be telling God to kill somebody. But he did. And he even wrote nice little melodies and wonderful rhythms so we could actually sing those same words (laughs) along with him. And it doesn't seem that God has any problem with that. God seems to say, this is a guy, this is a man after my own heart. I know he just asked me to kill people, but hey, uh, he, at, least, at least he's transparent, at least he's candid, at least he's honest, at least he's open about his feelings. So the disciples were following Jesus and now they're thinking, does he even care about us? So when you feel that way, That's a good indication that you might be following Jesus. Does that make any sense? Am I losing you? Let me suggest what you do. You feel this way? You think God doesn't doesn't care about you? You think, hey, I'm in this storm and God's left me and he's forgotten me and he's just not doing anything? Let me tell you what, this is a suggestion for you to do. Go somewhere, preferably by yourself, and tell God, just unload on him. Just tell him exactly how you feel. Tell him what you think about what he's doing, what you think about him, what you, you just unload on him. That's what the book of Hebrews tells us to do, by the way, in chapter four, 
Come, therefore, therefore come boldly. It means with all expression. It doesn't mean brash or arrogant. It means telling all. Therefore come telling all how you feel, what you think, what you, how you feel about God. God says, you can say anything to me because remember, I already know what you're going to say. You're not going to surprise me. But man, come on, come clean and unload this thing because you go to God, you're all upset, you don't think he cares, you tell him how you feel, you tell him what you think, and that might be the first true interaction you've had with God in a long time. Not this fake baby kind of stuff where you come now, I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep, but you actually are open with him. That's what he wants. But you know, that's not generally what we do. You know what we do? When we think God doesn't care about us, we get out our care meter. And we roam around trying to find out if anybody else cares either. And, 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 and when we do that, when, we, when we're... When we're Walking around with our care meter trying to find out, does any, I know God doesn't care, but does anybody else care about me? It just always seems to happen that you come to the conclusion that no one else cares either. Now, you don't tell anybody about it. You don't say anything like, hey, I, I, I need a little attention. I, I, I'm feeling neglected. I, I feel like God doesn't care, and I don't know if anybody else cares. No, you know, no we don't say anything like that. We just muddle around with our care meter, uh, try, looking for some kind of uh, obscure sign that, that someone cares about us. And because no one has a clue of what those unrealistic signs are, nobody meets the expectations that you're looking for, and, we, and, and then you conclude, well, Nobody cares. And then we isolate ourselves, and within a few weeks, we're gone. Can't tell you how many times that's happened. Let me show you a seemingly insignificant little line in this passage. Back in verse 35. Now, when they had left the multitude... They took him along in the boat as he was. And here's the little line. We just read over it, but look at it. And other little boats were also with him. And other little boats were also with him. Now, now this is an interesting correlation I'm about to draw a hope for you. When we get our care meter out and we determine, yep, nobody cares, the next line after that is, uh, 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 and nobody knows how I feel. Nobody knows what I'm going through. I'm the only boat like me. No one understands the storms I've seen. No one sees me. No one cares for me. Look at my boat. It just keeps filling up. Okay, little boat, just fill on up. I'll be dead in a minute. Does anybody else see this? Does anybody care about this? But Mark says that there were other boats with them. The amazing thing about trying times is that they can be used as a tremendous catalyst to connect with God. And they can also be used as a tremendous catalyst to connect with others who are in the same condition and their little boats are filling up with water just like you. So you're all experiencing the same plight. So now you can help each other. Here's the question. Can you live beyond your boat during a storm? Can you get outside of yourself, outside of your little boat, during a storm. Now, anybody can do it when it's calm. I mean, when it's calm, we all can get out of our little boat. We can take our little dinghy, float over to another boat, say, hey, brother, look, I just got a new boat. Why don't you come over and have some wine and cheese or something? Hey, just uh, come on over and uh, come take a look at it. 
But when the wind starts blowing and the waves start chopping up and everybody's getting wet, the last thing you want to do is get out of your boat and your little dinghy and float over there and say, hey, you want to come over to the boat? But that's the time that we absolutely need to do that. We need each other. There were other little boats out there with them. That's the last thing we want to do, but it's the very thing we need to do. Think about it. There are other little boats with them, and when Jesus said, peace, be still, it was not just the disciples' boats that got rescued, but all the other boats were blessed too. Now, I know we tend to get tunnel vision when, we, when we're in a storm. And, 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 and nothing, you know, we just see ourselves and we're so busy bailing out our boat that we just almost can't even think about it. But what if in the middle of our storm, we can reach out and we can help some other boat that is in the same storm we are? Can you live beyond your boat? We're not the only boat in this body of water. There's something about a storm that can bring people together if you're willing to let it happen. Are you soaked? Hey, me too. Let's go get some coffee. Are you going out of your mind? Is this thing driving you crazy? Well, me too. Let's go get some ice cream. I mean, storms can do that. <laughs> and there were other little boats. So you might, or you're following Jesus if... God drags you into a storm. Uh, you're following Jesus if you begin to think nobody cares. Observation number three, when you're following Jesus, your understanding of him will routinely seem new. I know that sounds kind of technical, but I found this to be true in my life. I've been with the Lord, like I said, 49 years. I find myself after 49 years having a whole different view of God than I did when I started 49 years ago. Look at, look at what Mark says in verse 41. And they feared exceedingly, and they said to one another, who can this be? I mean, do you get, do you get the idea that the disciples are seeing Jesus for the first time? Who, who can this be that even the wind and the, and the sea obey him? Everything gets calm. They, I mean, immediately, and they are just in awe, and they start looking at each other, and they start saying, who is this? Wow, did you see that? Good night, I didn't know that about him. He can calm the waves and speak to the wind? Who is this guy? I mean, my goodness. And even occasionally lost people, people that don't even know the Lord at all. God can do something extremely powerful and majestic and whatever, and they'll be looking around and they'll be saying, who is that God that can do something like that? Now, I think that's the purpose. I think that's the whole purpose for this event. I think the whole purpose for this event was so that the disciples could see Jesus like they've never seen him before. Absolutely. It's, it's let me show you who I really am. And when that monster storm just goes away immediately at the word of Jesus, I'm sure they're thinking, up until this point in our life, we never thought anyone could speak to the wind and speak to the waves but obviously, we were wrong. I guess you could say, you might be following Jesus if you don't know what you used to know. <laughs> that might be a good way to put it. When I first came to the Lord, I knew a lot about God. Oh, if you didn't believe it, just ask me. I could explain a lot of things about God. And I knew they were right. Now, after 49 years... I'm not sure if anything I believed back then <laughs> was right. I mean, it's just amazing. I don't know anything anymore. It, 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 it blows my mind. You'd think after 49 years, boy, you'd know pretty much everything. You'd have it figured out. Because you have a book 
I mean, it's just a book, right? The only trouble is it's a, it's a book that's alive. <laughs> that's the only trouble with it. And God just shows you all kinds of stuff all the time about himself that you never saw before. It's like seeing him for the first time over and over and over and over again. It's like that movie, and I'm going to probably date myself. What was it, 50 First Dates? That old movie where, where he, she has some knock on the head or something, whatever it does it to her. And every time she wakes up, she wakes up a new day, uh, the same day every day, and she doesn't remember what happened. And so this guy's dating her, and, and she doesn't even remember that they went out last night. So he meets her 50 times uh, in 50 days for the very first time. It's just over and over. I feel like that, that way about God. It's like 50 first dates with God, you know, over and over and over and over. I meet him for the first time over and over and over. Now, storms do that to you. Wow, I, I, never, I never saw that about God. I never saw that about you. Whew, over, right, and over, and over, and over. It just expands us. Now, now, now see, now you can understand what James meant, right? When he said, count it all joy, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and let patience have her perfecting work in you, her maturing work, so that your whole life can change and you won't, la you won't need anything. You can relax in the storms. You can look for somebody else in the storm besides yourself. There are lots of little boats bobbing up and down just like yours. And God calls us to a ministry like that. You know what? That kind of perspective will change your understanding about God. And it'll also change your understanding about the storms and the issues of life that you are in. And God does this because he cares about us. He loves us. He wants us to grow. It would be the same in, as in a family. When you had a family, I know everybody in here has had children and, and grown and, and have grandchildren and all of those kind of things, except maybe our teenagers back there, but... Um, it's, what, it's the same thing you want for your children. When your children were young, you had to sometimes let them go into some difficult things. I mean, you wouldn't let them go too far to hurt themselves, but you had to let them go a little bit so they would learn, hey, that's not good, or I need to watch that, or I need to be prepared for that. This is, and this is what God does to us. So that's what storms do in our life. And God uses them to change our perspective, to let us see him in a brand new light. All right, let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads.